In this video, we are going to talk about the spherical system, which is our second example of a curvilinear system, the first one being the um, cylindrical system that we had discussed in the previous video. So this is our overview slide, which we'll spend maybe three or four minutes on, and then we'll go through each topic in more detail and with more examples. First is just the definition of spherical coordinates. So it's a triplet, so it uh, specifies a point in three-dimensional space, and it's r, a radius, uh, angle phi, that's the angle from the z-axis, and an angle theta, which is an angle from the x-axis. Um, phi can go from 0 to pi, and theta can go from 0 to 2 pi. To we have these formulas here to convert from spherical to Cartesian coordinates. These are our three formulas. And we have formulas to convert from Cartesian to spherical. And we'll go over these with this diagram. As I had mentioned, the spherical coordinate system is another curved linear system and also another system where the basis vectors are not fixed. So as we move around in the three-dimensional space, the directions of the basis vectors change. One, we obtain the direction for each of the unit basis vectors for the spherical system by increasing the associated coordinate and watching how p moves, much like we did for the cylindrical system. We'll notice how the basis vectors change with the position of the point p, and if p lies on the z-axis, the directions of the basis vector with respect to theta and phi are not defined, and if p lies at the origin, our basis vector er is also not defined. The spherical system with the coordinates of the order r, theta, and phi is a right-handed system. It is also an orthonormal system. So you dot any uh, basis vector with itself and you get 1. You dot any basis vector with a different basis vector and you will get 0 because they are orthogonal. Finally, we'll look at the position vector and spherical coordinates, which can be written here as a coordinate times the basis vector coordinate times the basis vector coordinate times the basis vector. And you notice to get the e sub i coordinate, you dot the position vector r with the e sub i basis vector. And finally, because r is always perpendicular to the basis vector uh, theta and phi, we'll see that the, oh, this dot product and this product goes away. So our formula for the vector r simplifies to r um, the coordinate of the basis vector ER times the basis vector ER. That's it for our overview. So next we'll look at our spherical coordinate system, see where these formulas come for, from and what this drawing is. This drawing here is pretty busy. So first I enlarged it here and I tried to put some different colors maybe to see better what's going on. So here is our point P. Actually, yeah, definitely it's hard to see what's going on. This is our point P that we're trying to express in spherical coordinates. And the first thing we do is we have this radius. That's the distance from the origin. So R is our distance from the origin. Then we have this distance uh, or this angle theta. And theta is the angle that you would have to drop the z axis down until it touches p. So it's the angle between the z-axis and the, uh, the vector p. That's another way of saying it. Then we have this uh, phi down here. So if we project the point p down in the xy plane, then phi, so here we project it down so we get this angle here, which is kind of dotted in blue, then phi is going to be the angle between the x-axis and our projection down in the xy plane. And there's some other angles I should draw. First of all, this angle here is also angle theta because you know we have these what alternate interior angles. We have two parallel lines here. This is theoretically parallel to my z-axis. And so we have our alternate interior angles. They're the same. We also have um, these two parallel lines, this line here and this, which is theoretically parallel to my x-axis. These are two parallel lines which means that this angle in here, also an alternate interior angle, is also phi. And then uh, two other things. And, you know, sometimes I, I I've often don't like looking at the xy plane because it's skewed in these three-dimensional drawings. So sometimes I just draw it 
all fresh in two dimensions, X, Y plane, except I, you know, I think there's value in getting used to this look. So the idea here is this is the X axis. This line here is theoretically parallel to the Y axis if I had drawn it well. So that means this here is a right angle. And I know it looks skewed, but that's because, you know, the X and Y axis are skewed. Similarly, over here, we have the Y axis and this line here, which is theoretically perpendicular to the X axis if I had drawn it well, which means that this over here is a right angle. One more 90 degree angle that I should point out. When I drop this line down, it's perpendicular to the X, Y plane. So there's, you know, some right angle bracket here. I guess I'll keep that. It doesn't look too messy. So the first triangle I'm going to work with is this one here. So I'm going to outline it in yellow. This triangle here, I have this 90 degree angle and I have this angle theta here. So what I can write is if I want to find the length of this side, I'll be using the sine of this theta. Does the yellow, is it too bright? I'm gonna take off the yellow. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at the sine of this angle theta here. So sine of this theta is equal to this opposite line over r. That's my hypotenuse. Remember, this is my right angle. It looks kind of funny, but it is. Okay, so that means this line here, the opposite line, is going to be equal to r sine of theta, which I, have, I will label now. And now that I have this side, it's going to help me get the length of this here, which is our y-coordinate in the xyz coordinate system. So again, I'm going to highlight the triangle and then I'll take it away because it's very bright. This is my triangle. Here is my right angle. Here is my angle phi. And I've just calculated this side as being r sine theta. So now, what I can say about this, uh, this side here, this is the side opposite of theta, so then this looks so funny because it doesn't look like a right angle, but it is, that's why I labeled it, that our sine of phi now is going to be this opposite side here that we're looking for, the y, over r sine theta. So that means our y coordinate is going to be equal to r sine theta times r uh, sine phi. So that's the y coordinate. And now we can also get this x coordinate here, very similar. We have our right angle here, which means this over here is our pot our hypotenuse, actually, let me circle this in yellow, because I'm looking at this triangle here. So our hypotenuse, which is opposite our right angle, we know that that's r sine theta. We want this adjacent sine, so we'll look at cosine of theta. So if I look at cosine of this phi over here is equal to the adjacent, that's my, uh, my x-coordinate, over my hypotenuse, which is r sine theta, which means that my x-coordinate is going to be r sine theta times cosine theta. So the last one I want to do is calculate this z, and I do have another right triangle because you can see that this line here drops down and it's perpendicular to my xy plane. So I have this right triangle here from here to here to here. I also know this over here is um, opposite of my right triangle, so this is my hypotenuse. So what I can use, again, because I want z, that's adjacent, so now I can use my cosine of this theta is equal to adjacent, which is my z, over my r, which then simply gives my z coordinate is equal to r times cosine theta. So what we found now is our formula to go from spherical coordinates to Cartesian. Here's our x, y, and z. And then I'll note that r is fairly straightforward. Uh, if you square these, add them together, it'll simplify to give you just r. These formulas here, I'm not going to derive for you because like the ones I'm used to are different. I think they're simpler. So, but I will tell you that I, you know, they're, they're, these are equivalent. So you can use these, these are from your book. You can use them to do your Cartesian to spherical coordinates, but I will not derive them. And the last thing I'm going to mention is at this point P, we have labeled our uh, unit vectors. So R goes in the same direction as R. Our 
uh, fee is in the direction of increasing fee. So if you kind of think over here, we're here, if we increase fee, we're kind of going off in this direction, kind of tangent to what we were at before. And then similarly, this theta is coming down here. If we go tangent to it as we increase, this is our unit vector in the theta direction. We will talk about this a little more, but first I wanted to do some quick examples using these formulas here for some conversions. I have a couple of quick examples and then a few more. So first, convert to spherical coordinates, the Cartesian coordinates 1, negative 1, 1. So using our formula, we're going from Cartesian to spherical, r is going to be the square root of the square of each component. So the square root of 1 squared minus 1 squared, uh, this 1 squared is equal to square root of 3. Phi is equal to the inverse cosine of x over x squared plus y squared rooted. So that's the inverse cosine of x is equal to 1. And then x squared plus y squared square rooted, that's square root of 2, which is equal to pi over 4. And then theta is equal to inverse of cosine z over r. So inverse cosine z is equal to 1, r is square root of 3, so that's approximately 57 degrees. The next example, convert to Cartesian. So we have these spherical coordinates, 3, pi over 6, pi over 4. So this is uh, phi and this is theta. So x is equal to r sine theta cosine phi, so this is r sine theta, which is pi over 4, cosine phi, which is pi over 6, which becomes 3 square root of 3 over 2 square root of 2. y is equal to r sine theta sine phi, so that's r, which is 3, sine theta, which is pi over 4, sine phi, which is pi over 6, which is 3 over 2 square root of 2. And finally, z is r cosine theta, so that's r cosine theta is pi over 4, so that gives us 3 square root of 2 over 2. This next problem is express the surface in spherical coordinates. So we have the surface xz equals 1. And this is fairly straightforward. So we plug in x, r sine theta cosine phi, and then z, which is r cosine theta. We multiply them together, set them equal to 1. This last problem is the last of my conversion, so to speak, um, examples. But this last one has three parts. So it's describe and graph the surfaces. First, r equals a constant. Second, theta equals a constant. And last, phi equals a constant. This first one gives us a sphere. And you think about that because r, or the surface of the sphere. So r is some constant. So you kind of have this radial out thing. And then our theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So that gives us the circle. And our phi goes from 0 to pi. So that will give us um, the rest of the shell for our surface of a sphere. The next one, theta is equal to a constant. And sort of like over here, I like to know what the other variables are doing. So r is just ranging you know, from 0 all the way out. And my phi, that's this, it's circling. So the entire circle, whatever you do, you have to cover a circle of whatever's going on. So theta is the angle from z, the z-axis. So I think of, okay, this represents theta, and I have all um, variations of r. So this represents r and all my theta, except, you know, r should keep going on into infinity. And now I need to kind of revolve this in a circle. And what that will give me is this cone shape, this inverted cone. Now last, I have my phi equals constant. So I start by drawing my line at theta, uh, you know, at a degree of angle of theta from my x-axis. And because r can vary, this line goes out infinitely long. And then what I have is that I need um, this to happen from the z-axis all the way down. So whatever is happening happens all these degrees. So what I get is I cover all this space, I get essentially a half plane extending from the z-axis. So the next thing we want to look at is the basis because the basis vectors are not fixed. As the point P moves in space, the directions of the basis vector change. 
and we obtain the direction for each of the unit basis vectors for the spherical system by increasing the associate coordinate and watching how p moves. So let's give that a try. So for these two statements, the first, the second one here, how the basis vectors change with the position of the point P, and also how we obtain the direction of each of the unit basis vectors for the spherical system by increasing the associated coordinate and watching how P moves. I have this drawing here for your reference. I kind of like it now that it has colors, but I actually think this picture here of the sphere is going to serve us a little better. I'm going to start with this first point, one point P here, and you can see how our radial vector, the direction of R, is simply going to be radially out from the point P. So meaning radially out from, it's in a direct line from the origin outwards. And you can also see if I have a different point, let's say P over here on the equator, right, R, well actually it's not quite on the equator, R radially out, you can see our basis vector for this point is different. Next, we're going to consider this phi, which is the angle between x and the point P if we project it down onto the xy plane. So something like we project P down into the xy plane and we get this angle here, phi. So phi, as we increase phi, remember phi is going from the zero all the way around and back to two pi. So zero over here, we get to what, pi over two, back here we get to pi, three pi over two and two pi. So phi kind of goes in the circle, right? And the direction of increasing, it's increasing along the circle. I got rid of my arrows because it was kind of making it messy, but let's look over here at this radius circle because it's, um, at the right height over here, but as phi increases, it's kind of going to be tangent to the circle, which means it's going to be perpendicular to R because that is pointing radially out. And over here at this point, phi looks something like, well, this actually doesn't look like that other picture, but phi to me looks like it's going a little bit this way. E phi, this looks like E rho. Then last, we have this E theta, which is the angle from the Z axis, and it goes from zero to pi. And at this point, also, it, it's tracing kind of, what is this? Our theta is tracing kind of along this line here. So at the top, increasing, it's kind of, again, it's going to be tangent, so I need some black lines. This is how our theta is going to increase. So at this point, and let me clear up some lines again. To me, and I'm going to do this in black, it looks like E theta, I'm sorry, I'm used to calling it phi, goes in that direction. And the thing is, again, this is going to be perpendicular to our r, and in fact is also perpendicular to our phi because um, this tangent going this way is perpendicular to kind of the circle. It touches tangently to the circle. Another point, if P lies on the Z axis over here, then the directions for E theta and E phi are not defined. And then if P lies on the origin, E r is also not defined. Another point, the spherical system with the coordinates in the order r, theta, phi is a right-handed system. So that is, if you uh, orient your hand so it's pointing along r, and then you curl your fingers in the direction of theta, then your thumb should be pointing in the phi direction. It's also an orthonormal system. We sort of talked about how they were per perpendicular, the basis vector were perpendicular, and then uh, normal, you can just normalize your vectors. But being orthonormal means when you dot each of them with themselves, you're going to get a unit length, which is one, and when you dot one with another vector, you're going to get zero because they are at a 90 degree angle, they're perpendicular. Our last topic is about the position vector, R. 
In our video about cylindrical coordinates, we started by talking about the position vector. And we had noted in Cartesian coordinates that our position vector r is equal to the ith coordinate times the ith basis vector, also notated the ith coordinate, also notated x sub i. And then we can convert in three dimensions to our Cartesian coordinate r1, r2, r3. And we noted that formally r1, that is, the first coordinate is obtained by dot multiplying the position vector r by the basis vector e1. And so the ith coordinate is obtained by multiplying our position vector r by e sub i. And we use this technique to generalize any orthogonal coordinate system, which we just said the spherical system was indeed orthonormal and certainly orthogonal then. So we had this generalization, again, from our last video about uh, cylindrical coordinates that r is written as a uh, first coordinate times our first basis vector plus a second coordinate times our second basis vector plus a third coordinate times our third basis vector. And then to get r1, again, we multiply that by our basis vector, r by our basis vector. So here is r by our basis vector. To normalize, we divide by the length of the basis vector, but since they're basis vector, the length is just equal to one. So r1 is equal to r dot e1. And that's exactly what we have here. We have our position vector r is equal to our, um, our basis r dotted with our, I mean, I'm sorry, our vector r dotted with our basis for r, and then we multiply in that basis direction. Plus, we have our uh, position vector r multiplied by our basis vector for theta. We get a scalar here, so we get the coordinate, and we multiply in the theta direction. And then last, we take r, and we multiply by our basis, um, dot multiply by our basis for uh, phi. Then we get a scalar, that's our coordinate, and we multiply by our phi direction. And then last, we want to note for spherical coordinates, this is not a general case, but for spherical coordinates, remember we said r is always perpendicular to theta and phi. That means this here, this r dot uh, e phi goes to zero, and this r dot e uh, theta, I'm sorry, reverse them, r dot e theta and r dot e phi both go to zero. So then that simplifies our position vector. In spherical coordinates, our position vector is simply r times the um, e r basis vector. So to review what we've covered in this system, we talked about the spherical system, which is another, our second curved linear system. The first one is the cylindrical system we had discussed in our previous video. And as a curved linear system, the basis vectors are not fixed. And as we move around the space and look at different points P, the directions of the basis vectors change. These are the formulas we have for our spherical coordinate system. So in spherical coordinates, we're looking at a three-dimensional space, and we can specify a point with uh, the, the coordinates r, which represents the distance from the origin to the point. This is our point p. We have our phi, which represents if we put, take the projection of p down into the xy plane, our phi is going to be the angle between x and then our uh, vector p projected down in the xy plane. And then theta is going to be the distance between the z-axis, the angle between the z-axis and our vector p. We have these formulas here to go from spherical coordinates to Cartesian, and these formulas here to go from Cartesian to spherical. We talked about the unit basis vectors and the direction for each of them is uh, we can find them by increasing the associated coordinates and watching how p moves. Uh, the basis vectors change with the position of the point p. We have this other, um, a couple of other points. If p lies on the z-axis, then the direction for the basis vector e theta and e phi are not defined. And if p lies at the origin, e r is also not defined. And the spherical systems with the coordinates in order r, theta, Phi is a right-handed system, and it's also orthonormal. Last, we talked about our position vector in spherical coordinates. So we have our vector r is equal to our coordinate for the r basis vector, our coordinate for the theta basis vector, and our coordinate 
for the phi basis vector. And to find each coordinate, we simply dot the r vector with the basis. And then because r is always perpendicular to theta and phi, this term and this term goes to zero, so our r uh, vector simplifies to r times the basis vector er. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.